This is a Naga from the northeast of India presenting his headhunting trophy. This is an Igorot from the Cordillera region of the North Philippines presenting his headhunting trophy. And these are people of Taiwan presenting their headhunting trophies. What? These are not just coincidences. A tradition done in three faraway different places with the similar ways, purposes, and practices. Headhunting was done as a form of warfare, trophy, channels of rituals and spirituality, and many more exactly the same reasons adhered to by the Naga people, the Igorots, and the indigenous people of Taiwan. There must be a connection between these three tribes. And if these aren't enough, consider also the Dayaks of Borneo, who are headhunters with the same purposes. I myself is an Igorot and I believe that this is not just a cultural coincidence. There must be a connection between us and the question is, how? If you want to know, join me as we explain the closest possibilities. Howdy everybody, this is your Igorot guy Freddy. Welcome to FDG Stages. Let's begin. To understand human development, there is a study called anthropology that is dedicated to studying all human societies and cultures and their evolution. To understand how the natives of Taiwan, the Igorots of the Philippines, and the Nagas of the Northeast India, and even the Dayaks of Borneo are related or not, we must consider these important things. Number one, culture, wherein we have had hunting as jumpstart of this video. Number two, archaeology. Number three, DNA, and number four, language. As we have talked about in episodes one, two, three of this series, we have stated a lot of similarities between the Nagas and the Igorots. Headhunting, tattooing, settling in the riverbanks and the mountains, farming and terraces, dormitory systems, practices of the dead, clothings, ornaments, pottery, wood carving. And now we will stay a little while on the language. Linguistics is the study of language in all its structures and it has many branches including dialectology and historical comparative linguistics. One important thing to put in mind is that language changes and it redevelops itself. One great example is this. It's very hard to tell which language is this, but this is actually English. This was the old English and it was thousands of years ago. When we go what this text means, this is actually the Lord's Prayer. It's the introduction. Our Father who art in heaven, holy be your name. In between those changes, there were a lot of sub changes and developments. So how do we use this concept to understand where our ancestors came from? Language change is correlated with migration. And how is that? According to Dr. Richard Schreer, the triangle in the picture symbolizes a mountain, a sea, or an ocean. Letter A symbolizes the people that are living there and the language they speak called A. So the people living here who are speaking the language A were living peacefully, eating abundantly until they found out that they all can't live there because of developments and population growth. And probably also the resources there is not enough for everybody. And so some groups, some families decided to move. So if this is the mountain, those group climbed up the mountain. If this is the sea or the ocean, they sailed. And upon reaching the other side, they reached a river valley or a mountain that is suitable for living. So now we have two groups living in two different places but speaking the same language. Over time, as we have said, language changes. It develops. And when it does, it became language A1 and language A2, a little different that we call dialects. And many years go by, the language develops once again and it changes until it becomes language A and language B, which is totally different. Having said that, language A and language B 
may be different now, but they share a common ancestral root called proto-language. The biggest proto-language in the world is Indo-European language, where English, German, French, and etc. belong to. The most widespread language in the world is the Austronesian language, where we belong to. This language reached far away places that are almost impossible to be reached during the old times, thousands and thousands of years ago. Now let's take a look at how Austronesian, the language that we belong to, spread out. This is an illustration that shows the spread of Austronesian language. As mentioned earlier, Austronesian language is the most widespread language of all. You can easily spot that Easter Islands is far away from Madagascar. That is half of the world. And while you are amazed about that, you will be astounded once again that this spread happened not on land but between the seas and the ocean. The spread of the Austronesian language did not move by horses or chariots but by boats and more boats. This exactly tells us that the forefathers of the people in these countries are excellent sailors and navigators. So now you're looking at this map and you realize that we have a connection through language with Hawaii, Madagascar, Easter Islands, New Zealand, and even the former ancient Lapita. Now let's begin where all these journeys started from. If we follow the arrows back to where they started from, it will lead us into a small island that is now called Taiwan. Taiwan was a given name by the Chinese people of the Qing dynasty, but before that, the name of the island was Formosa. Formosa was the first name given by the Portuguese explorers in 1542. That means a beautiful island. Way before the arrival of the Portuguese in 1542 to Formosa, there were already Aboriginal people living there peacefully. There was an extreme amount of diversity within Formosa. That There were actually 20 tribes not including the sub-tribes that is nowhere seen in the Malayan Peninsula. That makes it again a strong source point of the Austronesian language. Around 4,500 years ago, some group of the Formosan people started migrating south. Formosans were good fishermen and navigators that made them cross the Batanis Channel and reached Luzon despite of how extremely difficult the journey there was. Then the Formosans finally reached the Rio Grande de Cagayan or the Cagayan River which is the biggest and longest river in Luzon. Following the Cagayan River, there were groups who followed the smaller Chico River and the other groups followed the bigger river all the way to Ilagan. The people who followed the bigger river to Ilagan continued through the smaller Magat River and they became the Southern Cordilleran speakers. During these journeys, some families settled. Some families continued to move. Those who were able to settle in Cagayan, Cagayan Valley, became the Cagayan Valley languages. Note in mind that in episode 3 of this series, we talked about the Nagas and the Igorots settling in river valleys, river banks, hills, and mountains, which totally happened during the migration. When the Formosans arrived in Cagayan Valley, there were already people in there, and these group of people were Negritos. <music> 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 
meaning the Formosans were not the first humans in the Philippines. But what happened? The Negritos were not so developed. They were just hunters for survival. On the other hand, the Formosans know agriculture, raising plants, and rice. Later on, the Negrito people yielded to the Formosans. As a result, the Negrito people lost completely their language. Up until today, the descendants of the Negritos speak pure Austronesian. And in that period, many interracial marriages happened, meaning some people of Formosa married some Negrito people and now they produce children with admixed genes. But where did the Negritos come from? It is believed that they migrated to the Philippines way earlier, 50,000 years ago, from a group of biodiversity hotspot in Western Indonesia. According to Dr. Lawrence Reed, the Central Cordilleran group that followed the Chico River was divided into two groups. One moved up to the valley and to its tributaries, leaving behind the Kalinga Itneg tribe. The other group moved further up the Chico River to where Bontok and Kankanae are now spoken. But there was one group that moved on, following the tributary which meets the Chico River at Bontok. They left behind a group that developed into Talubin languages of Bontok and then over the Mount Pulis saddle and down the river valleys to become the Ayangan and the Tuwali group of Ifugao languages. On the other hand, the southern Cordilleran settlers that followed the Magat River left behind the ancestors of the Ilongot or the Bukalot people. They pursued the Magat River that eventually made them the speakers of the Ibaloi and the Kalanguya group. The most interesting thing here that others oppose is that one group discovered the headwaters of the Agno River and moved down into the lowlands forming the Pangasinan language. If you listen closely to the Pangasinan language is actually very different from lowland languages. In fact, there are a lot of similarities between Pangasinan language and the Ibaloi. In actuality, there's a huge percentage that a Pangasinense and an Ibaloi can understand each other even though they're using their own languages in a conversation. That is a strong point of the migration that happened when a group followed the headwaters of the Agno River down to Pangasinan. The question is, if the Pangasinan people are related to the Ibaloi, why don't they have the same culture as them? More than three thousands of years ago before the Spaniards came into the Philippines in 1565, most people of the Philippines were headhunters. The people of Formosa and the Austronesian language they speak already evolved on each own in each area they migrated into respectively. When we get back to the map that shows the spread of the Austronesian language, the former Formosans had already sailed into many different places and regions. Some families settled and some families moved and sailed more. They've reached Malaysia, Indonesia, to the faraway Madagascar, to New Zealand, Hawaii, why Easter Islands forming new set of languages in the form of Malayan, Oceanian, and Polynesian? That far away? Let's get an example from Dr. Richard Schreer in Taiwan. The Formosan word for a banana hand that resembles human hands when you put them together that counts the fingers to 10 is pulo. One in their language is sa. So in classic Austronesian construction, 10 is Sa pulo. Sa pulo. In the Philippine language, we added a ligature which is ng. Hmm. That made it sanga pulo. Sanga pulo. That is in Iloko. In Tagalog, that may be turned out to be too long for them. That made it sampu. Sampu. Down to Visayas in the south. Pulu is still there and even down to Indonesia and all the way to Madagascar and Easter Islands. Let's all count 1 to 10 and we can find similarities. That is where we all meet. The proto-language that means we all came from a single ancestral cultural language. The Austronesian. 
So then we're not only related through language, but our culture says a lot of big things. As I mentioned earlier, the Dayaks of Borneo did headhunting too, with the same practices and rituals like the Igros and the Nagas with the Formosans in Taiwan. So most people in the Philippines were headhunters not until the entrance of the Spaniards in 1565. Within their stay there for 333 years, they were able to completely abolish headhunting in the lowlands. They were able to control the lowlands but not the Cordillera because the Igoros were too fierce for them and so Pangasinan, one of the places where people speaks a language which is related to the Cordillerans, completely lost their native culture and embraced lowland Spanish influence culture and traditions and all they have left is the language. It is indisputable that the Nagas in the Igorots, including the other tribes such as Dayaks of Borneo, share a lot of similarities in culture and traditions. But in this Austronesian map, Northeast India is not included. Yes, the Nagas and the other tribes of the Northeast India that has a lot of similarities with us do not speak and not even close to the ancestral language we speak. Instead, the Nagas and the other tribes of the Northeast India speak Sino-Tibetan. This proto-language is consisting of 400 languages spoken in China, India, Myanmar, and Nepal. So why are we so similar but not the language? There is one theory that the Nagas branched off from the Tibetan group and settled on the riverbanks and hills and mountains of the Northeast India thousands and thousands of years ago. Then some group traveled and crossed the mountains to China where they left traces of them evident in the people of the Yunnan province. They continued pushing through until they reached and populated the modern day Taiwan. This is just a theory but who knows the possibilities, right? The diversity of the indigenous people in Taiwan says that the migration from the Naga region was possible as the groups in Northeast India was also so diverse. One connection that they saw was the use of millet in growing rice. The Naga people used millet for growing rice which is exactly the same millet rice grown in Taiwan. The latest DNA study was done this year, 2021, and was released on the 22nd of March. The study was conducted by the Lorena Laboratory at Uppsala University in Sweden, one of the most recognized universities in the world. According to this study, the early Igorots are the ancestors of all non-Negrito people of the Filipino tribe, as well as the ancestors of the Malayans, Indonesians, and the Oceanians, the scientists promote the theory that the Negritos were the first Homo sapiens in the Philippines around 50,000 years ago. In this case, it goes very well along with the language migration that we talked about. But they also acknowledge that there were already archaic humans present in the Philippines before the entry of the Negrito. They present that the archaic genes can be found in both Negrito and Igorot genes. Going back, it is very possible that what we said about the people that came from Taiwan who settled and had interracial marriages with the Negrito people caused the found admixed genes. Finally, aside from the closest 
Taiwan Tribes, the Amis. and the Atayao. Together with the Cordillerans, the Igorots, they all share the most similarities That was very long. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with me until this end. What we can take away from this study is the commonality that we are related. We came from the same ancestors and we should recognize that and we should grow more love for each other. As an Igorot, I'm so proud of my ancestry. I'm so proud and happy to know that my tribe, the Igorots, and our ancestors were the ancestors of many nations in Southeast Asia and others, all the way to Madagascar, Hawaii and Easter Islands. And as for the Nagas of the Northeast India, we are so happy to share a link through our cultures. And I hope that more studies will be done in the future that could uncover the mystery to manifest the connection between us. Friends, Kakailians, thank you so much for watching and being with me in this series 1, 2, 3, and 4 and more series will be coming up and you can share your recommendations and ideas on what to talk about in this series. We can talk about the people of Taiwan and their culture and their diversities. What do you want? Write your recommendations and opinions in the comment box below. Salah Salamat. Thank you so much everybody and I will see you again on our next docu-commentary episodes. Thank you everyone. See you. Cheers.